Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Belly to Belly. And we're here talking with great friend, Micah Boster. Welcome, Micah. Hey, how you doing, Bill? Great. So our topic today is uh, scale up hiring strategies. And um, your company, Nighthawk Advisors, you've had so much experience in working with scale up companies. Um, before we kind of dive into the topic, I'd love to just get a quick intro to Nighthawk Advisors and your work, just so our audience has context to your comments. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a I'm a tech lifer. Um, I've spent most of my career in sales and partnerships and operations um, strategy. And so I spent the first half of my career at Google. Um, and then about 10 years ago, I moved back to New York and I've done early stage operations in four different uh, four different New York City startups and kind of gotten a bunch of experience seeing what goes right and what goes wrong. Um, I started Nighthawk about six or eight months ago um, because I'd seen that, you know, the climate's changing and businesses need to execute better and startups are not always great at that. Um, so I take an approach where I look at the business operating system of the company. We really dig in on sort of all of the, how you do things, how you set goals, how you set resourcing plans, how you execute against those. And we look at ways for companies to improve those and build a strong foundation so that everybody can scale and everybody can do the things that their investors want them to do so that they can keep raising money and growing. Um, because the days of just getting a big check and then doing whatever for a couple of years as you sort of fall, try and fall into product market fit are really over. Um, you know, it's a different climate and money's expensive now and things are different. Besides the fact that people want to succeed, so yeah, it's, exactly. Uh, <laughs> plus, plus every, every every founder out there wants to, you know, everybody wants to be Mark Zuckerberg, right? And yeah. everybody wants to to grow something that really is impactful. And in order to do that, you need to build a foundation so that you have something to get off of, and you have to build the right team in order to do it with you. That's great. Well, fantastic. So we we had a, a call uh, last week, and which was was great. It was great to learn more about what you do. But while we were talking, one of the things you mentioned that just kind of really intrigued me was um, talking about um, the process that that you've seen work really well for um, scale ups in terms of hiring. And I guess what I what I'd like to do first is maybe ask you about where to where do scale ups get challenged when they hire? What are the kind of the big mistakes that you see them make? Yeah, so I see a lot of um, companies as they start to maybe they bring in a little bit of money, you know, a seed round or an A or or whatever. And you start to have some resources, you start to get some customer traction, and then you start to have problems, right? Because complexity becomes a thing. And in order to solve those problems, you start hiring people. And a lot of times, because most people have a million things going on and they don't have a clear plan, the hiring can get reactive, right? You, you, you know, oh man, we need to get a marketing person because all of a sudden we've got, you know, we need more demand, we need to drive more outreach, we need to get out there, whatever, whatever it is, you know, sales or engineering or product or product marketing or, 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 or all kinds of things. And people go out and they, they try and hire somebody and they try and hire somebody fairly senior to kind of own the function. And a lot of times the founders don't really know what the function should be doing, right? So you end up with this really kind of weird situation where you're trying to hire a very senior person. They're very expensive. You don't know that person and you don't even know kind of what they're, they're really capable of doing. And you end up, you know, bringing people on and they're not usually the right person. And part of that is, you know, when you're hiring senior talent as a startup, you're 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 fishing in a little bit of a weird pond, right? Being a an early stage employee at a startup who's not a founder, you take a lot of risk and you don't get founder level equity. So, you know, a lot of the folks who you who wind up in that pool are maybe switching to startups from big companies, maybe they've had a series of things that didn't totally go right. There's they're usually sort of um a little bit, you know, it, it, it's not always the A plus pool and you are disadvantaged as a company trying to hire these people, right? Because you don't have the resources, you're not Google, you're not a name, you're not even a startup, you know, necessarily with traction. So you're sort of selling them on your dream and some equity upside. And that's hard, right? So what, what I've seen time and time again is people bring in senior people too early who end up not being the right fit or the right people, they spend a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy in the company. And then they have to move on, you know, three or six or nine months later, um, because they sort of screwed up. And if you do that too early, when resources are really at a premium, you can really put yourself behind the eight ball. 
Mm, that makes total sense. And I've seen this happen so many times. So um, how, how do companies solve that then? Yeah, so I, I think there's a couple of things to do. One thing, and this is like, it sounds trivial, but it's it's funny how infrequently companies, in my experience, do this. One thing is to be really clear at the very beginning when you're putting together your founding team, um, what you're trying to achieve and sort of what the what's core and what's not core. So for some companies, technology is absolutely core. If you're starting an AI company, you better have a technical co-founder and they better know the deal. Because if you try and bring that stuff on, you know, you're you don't have any way to check the people who who you bring on and know whether or not the approach they're taking makes sense or anything like that. You know, if you're generating IP, you need a technical co-founder. If you're not, for example, I was the CEO of a company um, that we were creating tools for yellow taxis to compete against Uber and Lyft. Hmm. You know, we had a great taxi meter and we built some custom software on top of it. And the, the software was sophisticated, but it was pretty straightforward. We, you know, we didn't need necessarily a CTO on the founding team. That was something we could bring on board because what was core was actually the customer service and the, the outreach and the positioning and the regulatory work and all of these other things. So it's important, first of all, to make sure that your founding team has core bases covered. And then I think that once you get past that, I think that the thing that I suggest until you get to MVP, um, certainly, and probably until you get to product market fit, I highly suggest that uh, most small companies spend more time looking in the sort of in the fractionals market um, and try and bring on specific people to solve specific roles for a specific time frame. And I think that that is, um, it's interesting, you know, it changes you from being kind of a seller where you're trying to sell this job and try and get somebody on board and you're trying to convince them that it's a good idea to a buyer. Because now all of a sudden you're talking to this pool of experienced people who want to come work for you, who want another client, who want to pick you up. And you can bring in people for substantially less money. They're not going to be full time, but for substantially less money who can really own a function and deliver results. And that will get you through this development period until you really understand what your product market fit looks like, what your growth plans look like, and who you need to scale. And then you can bring in your, your senior leadership team. You're going to have an easier sell at that point to bring them on board. They're going to have an easier job to walk into because they're not starting from scratch. So that that is the broad approach that I recommend to most companies. You know, there's obvious exceptions to this. If you're if you raise, you know, forty million dollars or whatever, you know, your your growth acceleration might look different. But from for most companies, I think this is a really sound approach. And you know, Bill, it gets back to this sort of analogy that I think of when you think of the life cycle of a startup, which is um, it's like a train, right? And it's cruising and it's stopping all the time and people get on and people get off and the same people generally don't ride the train from the beginning to the end. And the thing about the train metaphor is like at the beginning, it's like you're leaving Grand Central Station and going to the suburbs or something. You're making a million stops. You're making all the stops in, you know, in the city and in the close in suburbs and all of that. And you're going to be changing. Your needs are going to change. The people you bring on are going to change. The problems you need to solve are going to change. When you get, a little farther out in the countryside, you go express. And then all of a sudden, you know, you need people who can deliver for longer periods of time and, and, and sort of drive a different set of results. But I think that if you think about that, you know, your goal as a, as a founder is to A, preserve capital and be disciplined about how you spend it and B, preserve as much flexibility as you can so that your team can, can kind of grow and scale with you. That's so impressive. Yeah, no, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about a model of, of company growth that uh, uh, that we used to use quite a bit. Uh, and basically, it, it would equate essentially the life cycle of, of a company to um, essentially a person growing. So you go from sort of inf infancy, you know, through adolescence, through teenage years, uh, sort of on to, you know, various maturity levels. But you you think of the trouble or challenges that an infant can get into is not anywhere near what a teenager can get into. And so, I mean, as you were talking about that, I'm thinking about- As, it, as the father of a three-year-old, I'm not sure yeah. that's true, but, but, but <laughs> you'd yeah, be but, surprised. But, yeah, but that, that whole idea that um, that the, the sort of wisdom you need and the experience that you need at adolescence is totally different than what you need to get Completely. to transition those various other stages. So I, yeah. I, I love I love exactly what you're saying. It makes total sense.
yeah and you know the the zero to one metaphor is like is a fairly common you know trope in in sort of talking about startups and i think just having spent 10 years kind of in the trenches making things work in these early stage companies they're just so different than even a series b kind of company where like startups generally at the beginning barely even look like companies right like they're weird stressful school projects almost right where everyone's running around like crazy people trying to get things done and everybody's doing 37 different things at once and you know i think the the bottom line with these really early stage companies is there's not really any structure in place but things need to get done and you need people who are capable of kind of you know, building the airplane while you're flying, right? Who are able to not only execute and get things done, but also do it in a way where like, all of a sudden, you know, they don't have the marketing budget they thought, or all of a sudden, you know, their partner bails on them or their deal didn't close and all of a sudden their fundraising's delayed and you got to figure it out, right? Um, that's not really a skill set that exists <laughs> or, or that's as important as you go on. And it's not always the same people who are good at that. Right. No. It, yeah. It's it, the the experience of having seen it before and being able to navigate um, through that that those chasms uh, is probably really really yeah. critical. Yeah. No. That totally makes sense. So yeah. when you think of uh, founders that you and, and this may be shifting just real quickly for a second. You know, if you think of founders that you've seen be the most successful, is there a common trait that each of them uh, tends to have um yeah i think i mean honestly this sounds cliche but i think it's on some level it's humility um mm. you know I, th I think being a founder is sort of an inherently egomaniacal thing to do i don't mean that even badly right but you no. decide that you you have an idea you're going to change the world with it right i mean mm -hmm. that's the the audaciousness of it is sort of the point mm -hmm. um I think that the founders that, I mean, I think of one in particular who um, I worked with who who's a multi-time founder and she's, she's really amazing and impressive and has had several good exits. Um, I think they know the things that they're good at and the things that they're not good at and they believe in expertise and they believe in help and support, right? So um, this is why, I think it's important, you know, I talked about how you have to like really think about the skills on your founding team and, and things like that. And you need to be honest about, you know, if you've never thought about product and if you don't even know what product means, you probably shouldn't be overseeing the product team because you're going to forget, you're not going to know all the questions to ask, you know? And, and I, I think the founders who have taken an approach of like, I'm good at certain things and I don't know anything about the rest of it. So I need smart people to help me, I think is by far the best approach. And I think that that kind of, if you can kill your ego in that domain, I think it opens up a huge range of possibilities of staffing your company with, you know, really good fractional talent or or whatever um, you need in order to kind of bring it bring it on board. So so that that yeah. to me has been the most important thing that I think I've seen. I, I love it. That's perfect. Well, Mike, I think we're pretty close to the end of time, but I really appreciate sure. you taking the time today to uh, share these thoughts and, and uh, so powerful. And is it okay if we share your information in the uh, description below? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love it. And, um, you know, if, if any of your listeners uh, have questions about this or anything, feel free to reach out. I'm very available and I'd love to talk. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your comments. Cool. Thanks, Bill.